Good afternoon. Appreciate everyone being here for our inaugural meeting in the Kentucky Health and Human Services Delivery System Task Force. And with that, we'll start with uh, our uh, roll call, please. Senator Rocky Adams. Senator Funky Fromeyer. Senator Harper Angel. Senator Mays Bledsoe. Representative Heverin. Representative Mosier. Representative Neighbors. Here. Representative Stalker. Present. Co-Chair Meade. Here. Co-Chair Meredith. Present. We do have a quorum to conduct business, so we will proceed. First, let me uh, thank everyone for your willingness to serve on this task force. This is the inaugural meeting, but in a sense, it's not an inaugural meeting because of the continuation of the work we did in 2022 with our um, task force for reorganization of health and family services. Uh, that task force was a result of um, uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 20, and uh, the work for that committee uh, resulted in Senate Bill 48, which we're going to cover in some detail today. So this is actually a continuation. What we realized last year, almost to the inaugural meeting of the committee, was it was too big of an animal to take on in one interim session. This could be two, three, possibly four-year task force when it's all said and done. And certainly we want to acknowledge that the Cabinet for Health and Family Services is our largest cabinet in state government with the close to, uh, I think it's 7,000 employees and I think uh, responsible for about $30 billion in, in funds that flow through the department. So again, it is a huge uh, bureaucracy in itself. And I remind folks again that we didn't appoint this task force because we see anything wrong and that we're trying to be critical of anyone. We're just trying to provide the best service we possibly can to our constituents to improve efficiencies and effectiveness in each and every way that we can. And I want to personally thank uh, Secretary Freelander for his willingness to cooperate with us in, in this. Uh, he was instrumental in our last task force uh, session in providing information, providing these people to us, making them available to us, and the wealth of information they have provided. Unfortunately, you new members are not going to have, be privy to uh, a lot of that information. What we tried to cover in the session last year was focus on the organization itself. And um, again, uh, possibly we want to provide you with those um, uh, organizational charts because it's a it's a massive department that has grown over many, many years. Uh, we think that this uh, session, this task force here in the interim will focus more on operational issues, again, trying to provide uh, means to improve how the services are delivered uh, within that particular cabinet. And um, with that, again, I want to thank each and every one for willing to participate. Uh, it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose a little bit, but I just ask you to be uh, patient with us. But uh, with that, um, I'd ask you to take a look at the uh, Organizational Task Force final report, which we provided to you. If you would, please turn to towards the back. First part is a summary of the findings of the task force, but uh, these pages aren't numbered. But if you go back to recommendations, I want to speak briefly to each one of those and how those were incorporated into uh, Senate Bill 48. So you see, the first recommendation was that we continue the task force through interim uh, 2023, which we have done by appointment of this task force. Second recommendation uh, dealt with child support enforcement program, and we recognized there was quite a deficiency there in trying to collect those funds. So Senate Bill 48 calls for those functions to be moved to the Office of Attorney General. With a very extended timeline, it won't happen until January of 2025 to give everyone uh, plenty of time to prepare for this. Uh, we also uh, took the Office for Children and Special Health Care Needs, um, put that service on the Department for Public Health, which certainly just made sense because that's where the majority of our physicians are, are uh, employed and involved. So that was included in that bill. Recommendation four was to take the Family Resource Centers and Voluntary Services uh, or serve Kentucky and move those to the Educational Labor Cabinet uh, through intensive lobbying and negotiation and discussion. That recommendation was not included in the final passage of Senate Bill 48, but it is something I think we need to take a look at uh, once again. Because what we're attempting to do is align um, responsibilities with accountabilities 
and I think there's a good argument to be made that uh, those could be better served through the um, uh, education and um, labor cabinet, but again, point for discussion later. The Office of Ombudsman Administrative Review and the Office of Inspector General, we had a lot of discussion about this during uh, the last session after the bill had already been filed, and the final decision was made that we would not act on that at this point in time, so that'll be another point of discussion uh, this year. Recommendation 6 was required Department for Medicaid Services and um, um, Department of Aging Independent Living and DBHDID to identify and eliminate redundancy barriers. Uh, that's a challenge that's gone to the Secretary uh, to give us a report in uh, December of this year. And require the Human Office of Human Resource Management to work with the Personnel Cabinet to identify systemic barriers and redundancies. I'll talk about this just a little bit. Uh, we have some problems with trying to get people on board on a timely fashion, and we kind of have Secretary for a better um, one of a better description, and almost like two personnel cabinets. We have the statewide, but then we have that function within the cabinet itself. And there is some redundancy there, so we're looking at how maybe we can eliminate that redundancy and get people hired quicker. The uh, state guardianship program within the Department of Aging and Independent Living. Um, we um, suggested that those uh, should be in the jurisdiction of DCBS. And last but not least is that because of the growth of the Medicaid program and demand for public assistance that um, – we need to reevaluate the committee structure of our General Assembly, which we did. And quite truthfully, I think that's one of the most impactful recommendations that we made. As you folks know, before this bill uh, was passed, we had a uh, committee for health and family services in the House and the Senate. We split that function. Now we have health services and we have uh, family and children services. And part of the problem for our newer members was that so much legislation has come to that committee because you would expect, since this is our biggest cabinet, this is also one of the biggest committees in terms of responsibilities. So we wanted to buy those functions out. And I think the, the success we saw in the last legislative session was, was indicative of the need for the split of, of that within our um, legislative bodies. It's worked very well. Quite candidly, I think that um, the issues of children and family services had a tendency to take a back seat to health care issues, and that's where we gave our primary focus, and that was not intentional. That's just the nature of the beast. But now since we've divided those issues, I think it's going to make us much more uh, uh, responsive to the issues that we face. With that, I know that was very brief, but are there any questions or discussions about any of those recommendations? If not going, going gone, we'll move on to the fourth agenda item. That's an update from the Cabinet for ha Health and Family Services. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank I'm you Eric for being Friedlander, here. Friedlander, Secretary of the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. Uh, is this the first meeting of the interim? I think it's close, isn't it? Uh, I don't believe so. I think there were some last week. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was hoping I was first. Um, <laughs> You're still special to us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, just a brief update on the implementation of uh, uh, Senate Bill 48, the, the reorg on, at the Cabinet. Uh, so what we've done is, is we've met with uh, first – uh, Mr. Duke, General Counsel, and Mr. Maddox for uh, Attorney General's Office have met and talked, um, and, and we've had pretty good discussion. Um, obviously, there, there's, for lack of a better, but I'm just going to, my firm grasp of the obvious, um, with what would probably be within the Attorney General's Office, a new Attorney General, um, they wanted to make sure that we had a transition book that was written with everything that will be in about the transition on child support enforcement and hearings coming out of the uh, Ombudsman's office. So um, we we had started talking with um, county attorneys a little bit, and they really wanted us to slow down. So we have, and it makes sense. Um, and so we're going to coordinate with them as we move forward and talk about that that transition. Um, and so know that that, that initial discussion has occurred. Um, and that's that's pretty much where we are. Um, and we've agreed that uh, we will we will move forward in lockstep with them. Secretary, um, let me let me uh, um, interject just briefly, just to kind of bring the other members up to yeah. speed on this oh, discussion. Yes. Was um, the County Attorney Association was very instrumental in getting this legislation finally passed. 
Uh, they actually had did a study, I think it was back in 2015, uh, about this particular issue and had recommended that uh, those functions go to the Attorney General's office, but they wanted to make sure that we did it in a very stepwise fashion. Uh, they were the ones that originally threw out the date of, um, I think I said January 1, but I believe it's July 1 of 2025. Mm -hmm. And the reason they asked for that extension was because that's when the contracts uh, with county attorneys are, are written. So um, they also asked the Attorney General's office if they could put together a work group with them, which the Attorney General's office had agreed to. So we're trying to do this in very uh, methodical, stepwise fashion. But thanks, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. And the number of employees, just the raw number of employees, is actually as big, if not bigger, than the current Attorney General's office. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a very complicated program around child support and collecting child support right now through the county attorney's office. Um, so it's it's a complicated program and a big program. And so we, absolutely, we need to take our time and make sure we do it right. Um, relative to, there was an office of the ombudsman recommendation that many of those functions um, move to the auditor's office. We've also had a sit down with folks from the auditor's office, uh, including the, the deputy auditor. Uh, and also had a, a similar discussion, but more in depth, uh, around the functions of the ombudsman's office, um, what what in the bill we're talking about to transfer. Uh, it, it it was, um, I guess it's not funny, but we were talking about all the programs at the cabinet. And uh, uh, one of the folks from the auditor's office said, what's this about radiation? And they're like, well... You know, we do do some regulation of radiation and radioactive materials as they come through. And as a part of the cabinet program, somebody could call into the ombudsman's office and, and, and have concerns. So um, I think that to your earlier point, uh, Chairman Meredith, the breadth of the work that's done in the cabinet, uh, including public health, sometimes is surprising. So um, again, we, we sort of ended up in the same spot where we're going to make sure we have good transition documents written so that nothing gets lost in, in any transfer that may or may not occur. Um, beyond that, uh, there have been numerous meetings between uh, our, our Department for Public Health and the Office of Children with Special Health Care Needs in terms of what that might look like. Um, <laughs> we're still not in complete agreement about what the budget how we will display the budget in the next uh, uh, budget session, and then, um, but uh, you'll you'll see. We'll, we're we're working on what those details are. We're working. We're going to begin work on the personnel crosswalk that will. Um, uh, I think because some of that reorg language is interesting, we'll we'll make sure that we present that that reorg crosswalk for the Attorney General's office, for the Auditor's office, and then internally within the Cabinet. Um, we, we have just had some very, very, even more initial than anything else I've described uh, between Department of Aging and Independent Living and our DCBS. Um, I still think we'd love to have a conversation, but we started that discussion um, uh, around what that would look like. Uh, but I'd say that's probably the, the, the least um, full conversation we've had, um, if I'm being straight. Um, we, we have started some of the work and some of the other recommendations around some of the Medicaid pieces um, and looking at what that might look like. Uh, and, and so hopefully I'll have a, a report for you in December. And um, we can go through some of that when we get to the, to the legislative piece of this later on in the agenda. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes. Representative Sarah Stocker, Jefferson County, District 34. Um, clarifying question, when you talked about child support payments mm -hmm. being moved over to the Attorney General mm -hmm. Office. Um, is that just, do those payments only include payments from one biological parent to another, or does that also include um, payments that biological parents might be, this is the assumption I'm under, that biological parents, if they have lost custody of their children and they are in foster care, out-of-home uh, care placement, that they are being billed while their child is out of the home and is needing to pay the state back as part of their plan um, to get their child back. Does that make sense? Like you have to work your plan, but, but it's my impression that there's also 
uh, families that are being billed for that care that the state is then taking on. And that sometimes that creates an issue with children being able to be reunified with their families if the families have yet to pay that or maybe were unaware of it the whole time. So I didn't know if that was also pulled into these child support payments. And uh, if you don't know, and I, I don't know, I, it's okay. If I start going down a wrong road, Lisa Dennis is going to come up here and correct me, okay. um, which is why I have everybody here. Um, but uh, so this is a, a, a relatively complex piece because it is a, a federal piece. So court ordered child support, if, if somebody gets in arrears or, or any kind of uh, uh, payment for children, right? Uh, so some of that comes to us. Um, the, the cabinet's responsible for trying to figure out how to establish paternity, how to keep up and, and sometimes transfer those payments from, from non-custodial parent to custodial parent. Um, so yes, all of that occurs. Um, oftentimes people get in arrears, particularly relative to the population served through, through child support enforcement. And th that can cause all sorts of challenges, particularly with people as they re-enter from if they happen to be incarcerated, it might be why they were incarcerated. It, there are lots of levels of complexity to this. Uh, our collections are, are behind. Um, and so uh, the challenges of uh, performance of uh, different county attorney's offices, um, that it, all of this comes to play. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's a longer answer, but, but that's, that's the gist of the program, and if I have missed in any way, Lisa, you can help me out. Okay, good. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> Just a brief comment about that. You know, we've made uh, much ado about the fact there were $1.4 billion in mm -hmm. arrear. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to caution our task force members. Just bear in mind, that's a number. Uh, what we're looking at is to improve upon that. We think there's opportunity. How much we can improve uh, – I don't th think anyone can speculate, right. but we have 120 counties, and each one has different situations, and the ability to protect or to collect these payments are different in Jefferson County than they are in Estill County, Kentucky. So right. it's a challenge, but we think by moving it to the Attorney General's office, there'll be better communication uh, between uh, the Attorney General and the county, local county attorneys and uh, possibly what we've seen in the past. So it's a stab at just trying to make a situation better. But appreciate that. Exactly. Any other questions, comments? Representative Meade, Co-Chair Meade. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Secretary, for being here today. Appreciate all the work that you do and your communications with us. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, with that transition to the Attorney General's Office with the child support, I know that initially there was some uh, plans on, on making some changes to the current system. Uh, since this change is taking place and this move is taking place, are there, have those changes been put on hold until that gets moved over there? The system is what's called a green screen system it is a dos based system we basically have to go to retirement communities to find programmers and i i'm, I'm not i'm a little funny but i'm not really funny um, it is the back end of the old unemployment system so we feel like we have to move forward um, uh, any system that will will move towards will move from that green screen dos based system into just something that that is is um, more modern, and so uh, I think I don't think we'll do anything that would um, make it any more. Actually, I think what it'll do is make it easier for the attorney general's office to take it over. They're really, it's ex it's expensive being on the mainframe um, from a COT perspective, uh, and so I I really think if there's data transition and migration issues it might be good for us to try to deal with them so so we are still trying to move forward we just we think it's the right decision um, and we think it'll actually be helpful for transition so that somebody doesn't have to try to transition and data migrate mm -hmm. at, all at the same time from a system that nobody knows how to write code for anymore and then uh, you you mentioned cot so is the is it the plan that the current staff it staff is it going to transition to the attorney general's office or will that be within cot that most of that staff's in cot okay and then uh i guess i've got one last question mm -hmm. so how how are you planning uh for the impact of existing MO, mous with business partners uh during that transition that's an excellent question uh, i think it's one that will 
it's a bridge we'll cross when we get to it. But I think all of those MOUs should transfer, particularly if we're clear about what they are. Um, and that's what we're hoping to do. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, Secretary, please feel free to proceed. Next agenda item. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it up back up. Thank you. Carrie mm -hmm. uh, Banahan, Deputy Secretary of the Cabinet. Lisa Lee, Commissioner, Department for Medicaid Services. So this next presentation is uh, really about the impact of the end of the public health emergency. Uh, we'll, we'll go through some slides. Uh, there's already one that's changed. Um, but we'll explain that as we go and some of the challenges we're seeing as we move forward. Uh, so uh, let's begin. Um, the first is just sort of a, a representation of Medicaid enrollment over the years. You can look at really this is basically over the public health emergency. You can see a pretty big dip around uh, June, June and July of 21, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's when we really stopped the major presumptive eligibility piece. And so you'll see what, what happened there uh, was we just, we rolled presumptive eligibility folks off primarily. So the ones that we had signed up, um, we rolled them all off, and, and since then, I think we've got about 500. We had gone up to, to like 120,000 120, during, the, during the teeth of the pandemic, and then we, we backed that off uh, uh, really where we really felt we were coming out. Um, and so that what you see there is really sort of just the, the hospital presumptive eligibility and nursing facility presumptive eligibility, and that's why the number's so low. Uh, this uh, <laughs> this is uh, caseload distribution, and, and Lisa, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about this. But but you see these caseload distribution counts. Um, you're going to see in that May number. That's one number. Your slide's got another number. Uh, my slide has another number. These numbers are are all, if I can say, just fluid. Um, these are projections as we run our systems. So. Um, know that what I'm going to talk about today is today's number. That's probably going to change as it goes forward. Um, but I just I just wanted to let you know, you'll see they're all within range, but they're all a little bit different. And that's just kind of how we're, how this how this process is going to work. So I just I want to say that up front um, and, and you'll see as we move forward. Lisa. So typically, um, during uh, traditional Medicaid uh, operations, individuals have to renew their eligibility every year. They have to do a recertification uh, packet. During the public health emergency, in order for us to receive that additional 6.2% increase in our funding, we could not disenroll anyone from the Medicaid program. Beginning uh, in April, we started renewing individuals, uh, that annual recertification period. So uh, we took uh, all of our cases, and we have 12 months now to get individuals recertified in that year period. So we have taken all of our cases, and because we had not recertified individuals during the past three years, our caseload for our eligibility workers have increased by about 20%. So the caseload distribution count that you see on this uh, slide represent about a 20% increase in workload for our workers. And as we go forward, um, as we get to the end of the public health emergency and cases are recertified, those caseloads will be uh, going down. So uh, typically Medicaid recertifies folks? Uh, on an annual basis. We had several years where we didn't. So we now have uh, caseworkers in DCBS who've never done a Medicaid recertification. Um, and we, we, so this is, this is, when Lisa says it's a 20% increase, it really is over what they've been doing around SNAP and child care and TANF, um, all of those similar kinds of programs. So um, this just gives you an idea of the number per month. We're essentially uh, re-enrolling uh, a, a big piece of Medicaid. Ah, okay. This is the one, right? Mm -hmm. All right. 
and you all have a copy of the new slide? Hopefully. Good, good, thank you. Um, so in the end, it was about 74,000 renewals. Um, and we, we really, the number of folks who were reapproved for Medicaid, right, and that's uh, those who have applied, gone through the entire RFI process, uh, got their information in, or we were able to do some passive enrollment, is really about 50%. So of that, well, a little more than that, but of that, of that 74,000, um, we've had about 43,000 approved, 43, uh, approved for Medicaid. Uh, so that's, we were expecting that to be higher, I'll just be frank. We thought that was gonna be a higher number. It just hasn't been. Um, and so uh, we think about 34,000 at this point in time are, are going to be terminated, but there's another uh, about 6,000 that are eligible for a qualified health plan on the exchange. We don't have the number of that group that is signed up. Um, you'll see we shifted that data. I thought it was more clear on this slide to show you how many folks actually have not re-enrolled or are not eligible to be enrolled in Medicaid. And that's that uh, 34,000 number. That's about 46 percent. Uh, so I just, I want to be clear, they're eligible for other health care, but they may or may not sign up for that health care. They know they're eligible. We, we get them with a connector or an agent to be able to sign up. But it's, it's not Medicaid. There's going to be a cost in, in, in many cases. So uh, we don't know that number yet. That's one of the numbers that's going to change basically every day. Um, particularly in if we are able to figure out how many of these folks actually signed up for a qualified health plan. Uh, you'll see we have like about, if you combine a couple of the numbers, about 110 folks who we're, we still have to process, but that was as of last Friday. Um, that number has probably changed. Uh, there are about another 2,600 where we have RFIs out, meaning we've asked, for, they sent something in and we needed more information, so we sent it out. That's a, that's a number that's going to change as well. So we'll see what that is. And then in all of this, we anticipate that, that some of the folks that didn't return their RFIs, even though, request for information, even though we, we really did try to front load those we thought might not be eligible, um, we're probably going to have to give you a couple of months uh, before we have a really at least better handle on it. But I didn't, we have these preliminary numbers. Please take them as preliminary um, because uh, they changed from this morning, um, to be frank with you. So it, it, these are just, this is, this is going to be close, right? This is not far off. So um, when you look at these numbers, we're going to be in this kind of range for this first month, give or take a few percentage points. Uh, but I, I, I just wanted you to know where we are. Um, these are, but I, I I think once we end this month, you're going to see uh, that that we'll be we won't be too we'll be a few percentage points here and there, but but we'll be really close to this. Um, and then what will happen, and what I'm afraid is going to happen, is some of those folks who dropped off are going to go to the pharmacist, they're going to go see their doctor, they're going to find out they don't have uh, coverage, and they're going to re-sign up. And we saw this with uh, SNAP when we started doing recertification. What happens is folks will drop off. Then they'll come back on, and and unfortunately these first several months, and we've tried to be uh, really clear about how we communicate. The managed care organizations are reaching out, the hospitals are reaching out, we're reaching out. Um, we've had the experience of reaching out to folks who said, "Stop calling me. Um, you, too many people are calling me about signing up. I know I need to sign up." So I know we've reached people, uh, but it, it's like it's like everything else. The reason we have about 110 is everybody kind of that last week, started to give us information and, and so it kind of swamped us a little bit, just to be frank. Um, but we've really, I mean, to, to have just 100 out of, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands that we're working on, uh, it's not great, um, but we're learning as we go. Uh, and, and we are. Uh, that's what, um, and we'll tell you what we're learning as we go. Uh, we're going to see who signs up for qualified health plans. Uh, we're going to see if we can figure out uh, private coverage. We're gonna, we're gonna try to figure out where we are uh, in terms of signing folks up. But this is, 
it's a huge task. It's one I think I, I've told several of you. It's 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 one of the things that makes me lose sleep at night. I have about four of them in the cabinet, um, but uh, this is one because this is a, a huge undertaking for every state in the country, and you've heard every state in the country going through this, but you need to know where we stand in Kentucky. The secretary touched on this uh, just a little bit. Um, on the previous slide, we talked about passive and active renewals. Passive renewals simply means that we have enough information in our system or we have enough uh, data sources that we can uh, determine an individual remains eligible and that individual does not have to take any action. Um, active renewals means an individual does have to take action. So when um, we send out our notices, either our request for information or our complete renewal packets for those individuals who have to take action, if they don't take action, we kind of, we monitor. Uh, we look, for example, if someone starts an application or starts to logs on to our uh, Connect system, that's our eligibility and enrollment system. If they log on to connect to start an application or to try to upload their information, they don't complete that process, we give them a little nudge. A nudge is just something to say, hey, you started this application, but you didn't finish it. We, you want to go ahead and finish it. We also have uh, sent out alert messages just saying, hey, it's time for you to renew. We have made uh, 791 alert calls, and you can see the uh, almost 17,000 nudges that, we've done, that we have completed. So we have the, just the number of applications that we have sent out, the renewal notices. Uh, this is just to engage our members to make sure that they respond to us. And one of the other reasons that we do this is it is a federal requirement for our individuals that we have to reach out to them in various modalities in order to contact them and make sure that they understand that they have to take action in order to remain enrolled in Medicaid. And uh, you all know you don't often hear me being complicated, uh, complimentary of our uh, MCOs, but in this case, they have really been aggressive about reaching out, working with their providers to try to get folks signed up. And it's, it's, it's been a challenge. So during the public health emergency, we had several flexibilities. Some of them pertain to providers, some of them pertain to members. And as we go through this unwinding period, we have to uh, go back, revert to the way that we conducted business prior to the public health emergency. However, there were some flexibilities that we implemented that we thought were very beneficial to either the member or the provider. And some of those flexibilities will remain. And we've just given a few little examples here. We do have the Kentucky PHE flexibility tracker that individuals can go on and look and see exactly a full list of all the flexibilities that we uh, implemented. But in May, beginning May 11th of uh, last month, uh, we did uh, suspend provider revalidations. Typically, a provider enrolled in the Medicaid program has to revalidate their information uh, no, no less than every five years or so. Uh, so during the public health emergency, we did suspend those. Those provider revalidations will now have to be uh, completed. Uh, we are no longer using unlicensed facility as al alternative locations. Of course, that was a flexibility that early on in the public health emergency, we thought we may need some facilities to uh, accommodate overflow of individuals in case we had a huge increase or a huge surge in COVID uh, individuals who needed to be treated. Uh, we did give hospitals a 20% add-on for their diagnosis related, related grouper code. That's just a 20% uh, add-on to their payments for any patient that was COVID-19 uh, positive or had a diagnosis. That also went away uh, May 11th. Our nursing facility, uh, $270 per diem add-on. Also for COVID uh, positive patients, that ended on May 11th. And the second presumptive eligibility period in a calendar year also ended. Some things that we're extending is long-term uh, long care resource uh, disregard. Uh, during the public health emergency, we uh, disregarded some uh, uh, in resources for individuals who are in long-term care facilities to help facilitate their application. We do go back and recheck those resources um, later, but we make sure that individuals who are in long-term care facilities can um, get their eligibility determined. Uh, we also are taking, um, implementing our 90-day uh, period for individuals to file an appeal and for the state to make a decision. Prior to the public health emergency, that was 60 days. 
uh, telepho- tele- telehealth audio only. We are remaining, uh, we are keeping that in place. However, non-HIPAA platforms um, have been extended only through August. What this means is when individuals uh, participate in telehealth during the COVID uh, emergency, Providers could use such platforms as Zoom and FaceTime. Those platforms are not HIPAA compliant and any HIPAA compliant platform for the use of telehealth will be uh, terminated on August the 9th of 23. Uh, Typically, if an individual disenrolls or uh, exits the Medicaid program when they re-enroll, we will assign them to a new managed care organization if they do not choose one. We will now allow 120 days for them to re-enroll. We will automatically re-enroll them in the last managed care organization they were in when they exited the program. Uh, Some permanently uh, implemented uh, uh, flexibilities include our nurses aid application. Instead of using a social security number or requiring a social security number, we will use their I-9 and expansions of telehealth uh, outlined in our uh, regulation that has been recently updated. So in, during the public health emergency, the department, as all state, all state Medicaid agencies, received an enhanced federal match. We call this our F-MAP. Uh, so we received that during the public health emergency. Um, as part of the unwinding, Medicaid directors were very concerned that uh, elimination of the public health emergency or termination of the public health emergency would result in a huge fiscal impact if that federal match just completely went away on the day that the public health emergency ended. There are lots of conversations with their National Association of Medicaid directors and others with uh, federal officials. And during the, um, the unwinding period or during the rules, they have allowed states to uh, phase down that FMAP rather than taking it away completely. So this just tells you uh, how, we're, how we will be, will be transitioning uh, that FMAP phase down. We do have some uh, criteria that we have to abide by in order to uh, get that enhanced FMAP through, uh, uh, through December 31st of 2023, uh, which is we cannot have any uh, eligibility guidelines that are more stringent than were in place before the public health emergency. Uh, we have to make sure that we uh, ha- help individuals um, update their contact information, and we cannot enroll anyone who had been uh, um, who did not return their mail without first making a good faith effort to contact, contact them using more than one modality, for example, a text, uh, email, uh, phone call. It's a big fiscal deal is the way that I will say that. Every percent is, is, a, is a tremendous amount of funding for uh, Medicaid. And uh, as you'll see, both with that, we'll get this up on our website too. We're going to be as transparent with this as we possibly can. And uh, again, we have our website, it's medicaid.unwinding.ky.gov, has lots of uh, information about our unwinding activities, uh, numbers, and FAQs, frequently asked questions if anyone is interested. So any questions about Medicaid? Let me start if I could. Um, You've done an excellent job as always, but I'm trying to figure out what Medicaid looks like in the future. You know, my first session was 2017. At that time, we had uh, 1.3 million Kentuckians on Medicaid. Budget was $10 billion. And I said then, so I think it's as large as it ever should be um, because if uh, we're getting people back to gainful employment and uh, we're improving the health of the population, uh, the funding should be sufficient. But now we're 1.7 million on Medicaid and, and the budget is $15 billion. Uh, and I know it's still early in, in our projection, but 2024 will be here before we know it with the budget. Do you have any speculation whatsoever as to what that number will look like for the next biennial period? I think it's really hard for us to project right now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be evasive. This, mm-hmm. The number that we had this month it really is surprising to me. Um, so I think it's going to take time for us to, to realize that because the number of folks on Medicaid and what that FMAP, that, those impacts go like this. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we're really struggling 
with figuring out how to give you an accurate projection. It is, mm -hmm. we, we just, if we gave you one before this month, that would have said probably one thing. If we gave you one after this month and just based on this month, it would be another thing completely. I just, I don't know. We just don't know at this point. And that's fair. I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, I, I, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, where we're going. Um, you would think with supposed the largest economic expansion we've seen in, in this state's history, we would see more people uh, within the, the private sector getting their insurance. And that's not coming to fruition at this point in time. And is is the issue is that these are jobs that aren't providing health care benefits or are we not getting people back to work as we anticipated or is health care just so expensive that people have no other alternative at this point in time? I don't know, but um, uh, it's like I say, these, these, these numbers are surprising. It, and so I'm asking the same questions you just asked me. Mm -hmm. Who on this transition to uh, uh, private health insurance and how can we figure that out or can we figure it out? Um, how many folks who are eligible for a qualified health plan have actually gone on ahead and signed up? Or are they waiting to find out that they don't have any and that this is their only option? Uh, I think we're going to see some of that. I can't tell you how much. Um, so m most people on Medicaid, uh, well, not most of the folks on the expansion piece of Medicaid have jobs mm -hmm. that are not paying them enough, right, in order for them not to receive Medicaid. Or they have a number of children that makes them eligible and, and uh, certainly can show you those numbers. I think we've talked about it before. Um, so, so there's that piece as well. Um, and then in terms of uh, increased spending by Medicaid, uh, there are places where we have, I think, done a great job, which is in the hospital outpatient program and uh, hospital inpatient program, uh, pay an average commercial rate, the hospital's paying the, the difference in the general fund cost. But that's, that's been a chunky expansion. Uh, I think once we add outpatient and inpatient together, for a full year, I'll bet we get over $2 billion uh, flowing to our hospitals, um, which keeps the small ones open um, and the rural ones open, and particularly outpatient's going to make that, the outpatient uh, atrip is going to make a big difference there. So um, a as we have discussed, if, if somebody, and I've talked to other provider groups about this, if folks want to provide us the general fund match so it doesn't hit the general fund and the taxpayer, right, let's, let's, Let's figure out how to do that. Um, also within, I guess it was my first session back, was, uh, the, was it Senate Bill 50, the single PBM? We've seen some savings from that. Uh, so it, we don't know. Sorry, it's a long way to get to we don't know. But it is, these are all the factors that are at play. That's right. I don't know We're going to have continued discussions on this. I know yeah. with budget reviews coming up that uh, you folks will be testifying numerous times. Uh, we may not have this opportunity to go into details we did in the past because we don't have Medicaid oversight any longer. We may have to do it within Health Services mm -hmm. Committee meeting. But I just wonder, you know, are there are there any goals, and is a reasonable goal, as to where we should be in terms of the health of our population? Oh. You know, we talked in, in, in nauseam about we were 47th forever. Uh, now we're, I think, around 44. That's still nothing to brag about. I think that's a direct result of people having access to uh, insurance that they haven't had before. But we're really not moving that needle a whole lot. And additionally, uh, getting people off of Medicaid into gainful employment. Do we have any targets for that? Um, because, you know, taking sick, sick people is, is not a good economic model. Right. It just it may create jobs, but there's a cost associated with that. So... Again, I think to sustain the program in the future, we have to improve the health of our population. And secondly, we've got to get our population off of Medicaid. Right now it's 40%. Right. So do we have any targets to address both those issues? Where would we like to be? The, the two pieces I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, and, and Commissioner Lee, you can chime in. Um, one of the things that is also excited about that ATRIP piece, right? Sorry mm -hmm. to abbreviate. Um, the uh, additional payments to hospitals is there's a quality piece to that and um, I talked with the hospital association they are excited about how, how quality is working 
I, I really want to, well, before now, but um, I think uh, <coughs> it would be wise to bring folks together, FQHCs, I'll put this to you all, FQHCs, hospitals, MCOs together, who should, should have the same goals of getting people healthier. And now we have funded, right, in, in hospitals, and there's certainly more funding that can be done. But within the hospital structure, a quality piece that I hope moves us forward. I think in, in terms of Medicaid enrollment numbers, uh, we're going to see what this what Unwind does to us. I expect it to be less than, I know it's going to be less than when we started. Um, and then uh, what some of the pieces that I'm excited about, Senate Bill 90, um, uh, Chairman Moser's community health worker bill that we're getting ready to implement next year, uh, as well as then some pieces around mobile crisis, which should help with, with homeless and, and, and first responders. I hope those things help us move towards quality, uh, particularly in folks that are, that are um, uh, have probably the most significant health issues. The same is true in, in child welfare. The other thing that keeps me up at night is, is our high acuity youth. And, and not having good placement for them. Uh, that's, that's just, that really worries me. It worries me for our social workers. It worries me for, for, for our kids. Um, and, and we've had hundreds of kids and we've tried thousands of placements. So it is, we, we've, got, we've got some work to do there uh, around where and how we, we can work with that particular population. It, it, we are seeing, I, I've testified here before, what we're seeing are, are kids who are more acute uh, in terms of their um, behavioral health challenges. Um, it, you've even heard it on the juvenile justice side, right? There are significantly greater challenges and finding good placement and good services for those kids has been a continuous challenge. We, at this, at, again, another compliment to MCOs, Aetna's been a good partner. Um, and we've talked about really kind of funneling to a, what's called a single case rate so that we can pay for services for these kids. It just hadn't had the bite I was hoping for. Um, so, so, you know, we'll, we'll try things until we, until we find something that works. Sorry, long answer. But sure, it's an appropriate answer. I'm curious, uh, Commissioner Lee, if uh, you're ready to comment on the deprivation index that was part of the uh, Senate Joint Resolution that we passed this last time. <laughs> Well, I don't think I'm ready to comment on that yet, but I think what I would like to add to Secretary's uh, comments related to quality, all of our directed payments for our providers do have a quality measure in it. There's something we're working very closely um, on to monitor. We also, um, our managed care organizations have value-based payments with some of their providers. Uh, we are amending our MCO contract to have value-based purchasing with our MCOs. We are going to have a withhold, and we are going to expect them to improve uh, the quality of services that they provide to our members, or we will withhold that funding from them. So uh, definitely looking at everything we can related to quality and value-based uh, payments, but we also need to look at our prevention services. We need to focus a lot on prevention. As you said, you know, sick care is actually just being reactive active to someone being said we need to be more proactive and focus on prevention now and in the future and I know we talk about um, the number of individuals on Medicaid the 1.7 million right now and we that is definitely nothing to boast about because these individuals live at or below the federal poverty level they are working they just don't make enough money to pay for private insurance or their employer doesn't offer insurance or they're self-employed so their only alternative is Medicaid or the qualified health plans on Connect. And in terms of that withhold, I do want to say um, we must be doing it right because they're really the MCOs are really complaining about it. And there's a way to, to not get the withhold, and that's provide quality. And so that's the type of thing we're trying to incentivize. Um, I hope I hope that we've done enough. And, and and honestly, I hope that we've done enough. Well, specific to that, there are safeguards in place to make sure that. Um, if they receive a reduction in their payments, that that doesn't filter down to right. the provider payment right. schedule. Yeah. Correct. So there are safeguards in place? Yes. You know, what keeps me awake at night is access to care. And I'm not talking about having health insurance because uh, mm -hmm. you can have health insurance and still not have access to care. And we heard testimony last uh, summer from all the MCOs that they're um, um, 
availability providers is like the provider networks are like 95 percent and we know that's not true as a matter of fact you know, dr stack we asked him that question put him on point and he said no that's probably not correct i think it's probably in rural communities and urban deserts more like 30 40 percent uh is is there any efforts to try to address that issue yeah. part of that's a health care provider shortage too um, as well as what I'm worried about is, and, and actually the General Assembly passed some legislation on this, to keep telehealth expanded because of the significant transportation issues we've at, that we've had for years. Um, and so there, there's been some, imp not some, there's been really good improvement in the provision of telehealth. Uh, and we just need to, to make sure that we're providing quality telehealth. So uh, I also, I do believe that, that supporting anchor providers um, like hospitals, um, is an important thing for us to do. And I, I believe I've testified about this here. Uh, when we've gone to the single PBM and went to the higher dispensing fee, I knew that uh, we'd gone too far. I think I might have sent you a picture of uh, uh, a chain pharmacy that was advertising for Medicaid patients, and that's when I knew we'd probably gone too far. <laughs> Duty noted. Senator uh, Mays Bledslow, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. I do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And this might be a native question since I'm new. Um, but back on page or slide three, you talked about the renewal case distribution, and I'm just curious about the data. Is there a cyclical month-to-month -month nature or trend of how those go up and down year over year, month by month? And if so, can you explain why? I'm going to let Lisa explain why, but um, really it, it does have to do with some of the cyclical nature of that it also has to do with availability of workforce so just straight up uh, the dip you see after the first couple of months is to <laughs> give us an opportunity to, to to really retool a little bit um, as well as workforce and then people come into our systems at different times uh, when when um, open enrollment occurs oftentimes we see a, uh, an increase in folks who come into Medicaid uh, through through trying to get just health insurance on, on, on our exchange. So you'll see there is some cyclical nature to it. And then it's also, um, we sort of front loaded a little bit uh, and with folks we thought were gonna be ineligible. So that's, that's why you see that, but all those things are factors. Okay, so in that, so looking at December of this year, 58,000 by January 83, that jump is because of new open enrollment essentially so, so what we wanted to do was uh, during our qualified health plan open enrollment which occurs in November and December there was a lot of activity a lot of applications a lot of case processing so we had a lower case load for those months for November and December okay right. thank you I appreciate that yeah. any other committee members the question comments yes please uh, looking back on, I think it's slide five, the outreach to Medicaid members, what, what, when you mentioned the passive renewals, mm. what is the data that you have that kind of immediately tells you this individual is going to continue to be eligible? So we have, uh, in our eligibility system, we have access to various data sources, such as uh, state wage index, uh, uh, birth and death certificates, uh, driver's license information, uh, post IRS. IRS, yeah, IRS. We have our income tax information. So we have all, we can ping all of those data sources. And we, we do that periodically through the year, too, just to make sure that everyone remains eligible. So we have, we have those data sources. We ping those data sources. And if our system, the information that the uh, member has input into our system, matches those uh, data points, then we do not have to uh, ask for additional verification. If, for example, uh, we can't verify an address or residency, for, we will send out a request for information for that individual to send us a piece of information or documentation to support that they still qualify or that information is correct. And, and also, let me be clear, we thought we were going to get about a 60, 70 percent rate of that. Well, you can see we were well under that. Um, so we, we've got a lot to learn and a lot to learn in our projections. Okay. One more question um, on this updated slide that you provided mm -hmm. for us, um, and you might have said it and I just didn't catch it, but I'm looking for some clarification. So 
um, the number of individuals terminated, that 34,000 and change number, that am I correct in understanding that that is a combination of people who may not be eligible anymore for Medicaid because they have transitioned into a qualified health plan as well as maybe other things like they just didn't renew or what Most makes that up that number? indented bullets under that is an explanation of what is in that number. Is that helpful? Yes. So each Thank one you. of those underneath, if we did it right, should add up to that number, uh, uh, that 34,000. Thank you. You're welcome. I hate it when our math is wrong. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, feel free to proceed. Mm -hmm. You want me to change the slides? I got it. You got it, okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Committee. Stephen Stack, Commissioner for Public Health. And I guess it's to me. So this is. Uh, for the end of the public health emergency, uh, this is a welcome time for all of us. It's certainly a welcome time for the uh, public health uh, community that's had to work so hard during the pandemic. So most of our federal grants um, have run their course and or the federal funding that we receive. So you look at uh, CARES funding, that's long done. ARPA funding, that's long done. Uh, we have special or designated funding for laboratory, uh, for disaster response, uh, for um, health equity work. Those grants were supposed to end, most of them, um, at the end of uh, June 30th, 2023, give or take a month. And they were extended a number of them to uh, have an extended spending period till next summer. So the spending plan for those has already been introduced, and um, we're really largely in final execution and wind down for those grants. So that's what the first bullet uh, mentions up there at the top. One thing you might notice for those of you who cross over when you do the budget next year, um, this last year is the final year getting money out. So this will be the last year that public health's budget is larger than what it might normally otherwise be for FY24. And when we get to FY25, the next biennium, um, we're going to recede back into more of what our normal footprint would be, uh, if, if that helps. One of the many big th things we've done is provide a lot of testing for COVID, particularly earlier in the pandemic and throughout. Um, almost all, well, actually, all of the regular laboratory testing is largely gone at this point, except for our ongoing support from long-term care facilities, so the nursing homes. There's a, about 300 or so of them, I think, that we support. And we have renewed the contract for one more year, and that will run through June 30th, and then the funding will exhaust, and that will be the last year that we do that support for. So we're just continuing a program that's already operating to help support the nursing homes, which is, as we know, because of the age of the population, one of the most vulnerable of all populations for COVID. Uh, for antigen testing, the things that most of us would use if we wanted over-the-counter that we have ready access to, uh, the federal government provided support a number of different ways, uh, financially where we could purchase antigen tests, but also gave antigen tests to the states so that we could support schools, K-12 through schools, and other educational environments, um, correctional facilities, uh, homeless shelters, uh, the public health um, community. We have um, distributed... Uh, a large portion of the tests we have on hand, we're continuing to try to distribute the ones we have remaining. Uh, those are ones that the federal government purchased at this point that were given out to the states. And then we have a small amount of money still remaining over the next fiscal year, so the state fiscal year 24, where we'll be able to continue to provide tests for the health departments, and then they can use those within their communities to support uh, high priority areas, uh, the correctional facilities. Uh, the school testing support will uh, dissipate, and that, that won't be there anymore. We, we found that there were a number of schools and districts this year who were interested, but there were quite a few who didn't want the tests, even though we offered them repeatedly. So uh, it's just run its course. We're getting to the end of that journey. Um, most responsibilities for the COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics um, either have ended, have transitioned, or are transitioning. So I'll give you examples. Remdesivir was the very first medication that was approved for use for COVID. That's all on the commercial marketplace now. It's a regular medication, fully approved, and, and it's purchased and provided at the discretion of physicians if they feel it's appropriate. 
uh, monoclonal antibodies that got a lot of attention during parts of the pandemic, those are gone. There are no more monoclonal antibodies. Every time the virus changed substantially, you had to design a new antibody for the new virus. And there's just not the demand for it at this point. And the combination of um, the number of people who have uh, some immune protection because they've been infected, plus the number of people who've had the vaccination, plus the, the large, probably majority of Americans who've been both infected and vaccinated, um, that in the changing of the virus has made those uh, therapeutics no longer economically needed or just uh, sustainable or needed. Um, the oral antiviral medications, Paxlovid, you see that commercial uh, on commercials and TV, uh, that's largely commercialized at this point, but the federal government still has a supply of that, and so that's available still at no charge for the medication. You may have to pay the pharmacy fee to have it dispensed, but available at no charge for the medication for many people, but that will all be commercial here very, very shortly uh, as supplies run out. And um, as far as the vaccines, the federal government has the most current bivalent vaccine and still has supply of that. So you can still go get your bivalent vaccine at no charge right now for the vaccine itself. And again, now that the emergency has ended, you may have to pay a pharmacy administration fee, which your insurance company would typically cover. Uh, this fall, if there's a new or revised vaccine, that'll all be the commercial marketplace with very scant exception if the federal government's able to put together a program for people without insurance. And then there'll be a, you know, a designated places you could go to get that or uh, ways to get it if you don't have access to healthcare insurance. So really, all of this has been mainstreamed into the regular healthcare system for the most part. And what tail part has not been is in the process of transitioning. And then another huge task that we did very early in the pandemic and throughout the peak parts of the pandemics was data collection and analysis. And that has also largely normalized into routine approaches that we use for other diseases so that we every year provide a flu report during flu season. Uh, we don't typically provide an RSV report. We have provided really um, substantial analysis in public reporting for the COVID pandemic. But now if you go to the website, like has happened uh, in states all over the country, uh, that has largely consolidated to very few data points because the hospitals just aren't being overburdened by COVID right now. So it's no longer necessary and the data is not actionable in the way that it was earlier in the pandemic. So it's not over. COVID still exists. COVID is still out there. People still should get vaccinated um, to keep themselves protected. But as far as the profoundly enhanced public health uh, support for it that has largely wound down in what we'll have in 24 is the um, final execution of the remaining grant dollars that we have. And we will have to have some continued um, narrowing of our staffing and predominantly in our disease management and tracking where we've been able to do some extra and enhanced work because of this funding. And that'll have to normalize into sustainable funding streams as the federal funds go away. And then the final thing, which I don't have any answer yet, none of us do, is the result of the debt ceiling discussions federally. Um, there's a clause in there at Section 81 that's only three lines. Uh, <laughs> gloriously short with pro pro possibly profoundly big impact for some of our programs. Um, unobligated funds are going to be um, taken back to the Treasury. And so we have to see how they define obligated, whether it's when they assign it to us, when, when we spent it, or when we have it budgeted. And that nobody knows the answer to. And the president just signed that into law yesterday, I think. And so we'll find out in the weeks ahead what the implications of that are and do our best to adapt. And so that's all I have, sir. There was an FAQ that said, well, what, what is the federal government going to take back? And they said, well, unobligated funds. And that was it. And so um, we're still reading tea leaves. Uh, we don't know. There was a table that was provided um, of the grants. Um, it, my eye right, looked to me to be too small to be a huge take back from the states. But again, I don't know what unobligated means. Um, I mean, I know what the word means, but I don't know what it means in federal speak. Uh, so uh, we're still monitoring what that impact's going to be. And, and I, th I think we might know, but I we don't know and it, it's it is it's a profound difference not only for public health but for the department of community-based services which you'll hear from next those those are pretty profound differences between those two and we just have one slide for public health here today so we're at the question point now if you have any questions 
I, I guess I'm curious as to what public health looks like going forward. And you've heard me say before in committee meetings that one of the good things about COVID, if there is a good thing, is that it, um, I think, heightened the public's perception of, of um, health departments and the services they offer. I think they were kind of an afterthought before this, and we understand they play a very vital role. And I guess I'm looking to try to determine what that role looks like in the future. I think there's tremendous potential for them uh, particularly in, in the area of improving the health of the population, but that's not a responsibility we've necessarily delegated to them uh, as a priority. I think it could be, should be, but uh, you've already acknowledged that we're probably going to see a contraction in uh, our, our labor force within the public health department. Uh, can that be mitigated to some degree by, again, expanding the roles responsibility of public health? Well, so the contraction because of the COVID-related work, but let me let me urge the legislature, you still have, you've done a great job and you still have important work to do in the next biennial session for the, uh, the next biennial budget. The public health transformation dollars you've given in this funding period have been really, really important to helping to sustain public health transformation going forward. So remember in 2020, House Bill 129 passed and that structurally changed how funding would be done for public health departments. But the funding didn't come because the session got cut short, but then all this COVID money came in. So it largely kept everything afloat, but it was kept everything afloat because the entire public health system really focused on one problem. Then the legislature came through and appropriated money, 17 or so million one year, 19 or so million another year to help support the local health departments to do core and foundational public health services as well as the local health priorities that are part of the transformation effort. So that work is well underway right now. I would say COVID has obviously been disruptive for all of us. I mean, that's undeniable. I mean, there's no one in the planet really who hasn't been touched by this probably. But it wasn't all bad for public health. It was horribly stressful and it burned people out. And of course, there was division within society about perspectives about should we have done this or should we do that? But what it did do for Kentucky was it brought us together in a way that hasn't happened for a very long time. And so I have viewed, and I would have done this with the start, but COVID made it really apparent and overt. I see the 61 local health department leaders as the chief health strategist for the jurisdictions they're responsible for, for the public health strategy. And I see my role as supporting them and empowering them and working together as a partnership. So Kentucky Public Health is the partnership of those two layers, the state and the local together, and the public shouldn't have to notice much of a difference. It should be Kentucky Public Health and behind the scenes we work together. The public health transformation dollars, along with our efforts to continue to transform uh, public health, will help, and it is helping now, the local health departments to be more solidified, more stable. We, we did rate increases for the salaries for the state health, for the public health workers in the state health system uh, in the last three months of last year that people haven't seen in a very long time. And we've got stories about people who thought they would lose their house, people who were worried their husband was going to die or their spouse because they had a terminal illness that they wouldn't be able to support themselves after they, they passed on. People who'd been in public health 15, 20 or more years and not seen those kind of salary increases that they now have a wage that makes it possible to continue to do that and be sustainable. And it's helping recruitment because, you know, when you can make $15 an hour to work in a fast food service industry and you were going to get paid $11 to work at the health department, it made more sense to go work in the service industry economically for families. So we are much more stable. I, I'm absolutely confident that Kentucky Public Health is better at, at this stage than it was three plus years ago they will be hesitant to invest in judiciously. And again, I don't want anyone to build um, a cliff financed workforce. We don't want to have to ever go back and do reductions in force if the revenue goes away. But there is a need to judiciously invest in some expansion in selected places. Um, they'll watch very carefully and see if the continued support for public health transformation continues in the next biennium, which will help to make that possible. But I, I think you should feel very proud, and I, I, I hope you'll take uh, a moment when you have a chance to thank the public health directors that are in your jurisdictions and your districts. Um, they really are leaders in their communities and have done a wonderful job, and we dialogue and communicate so much better than we did before. Um, plus, 
and I know this is a long answer, Mr. Chair, but we, we have done other things that have been good. We onboarded hundreds and hundreds of additional labs into KHI, the Kentucky Health Information Exchange, that now electronically report um, their laboratory test results for reportable diseases, and, and some of them and more on an ongoing basis doing electronic case reporting, which is when they have to report clinical data for folks who have reportable diseases. This is where the electronic health records help to save time for clinicians who are burned out themselves and overworked, but also for public health to get more quickly, more accurately, more efficiently that data. We have a warehouse that now has gowns and gloves and masks and, um, and vent new ventilators and, and resources we did not have. And those can help for floods and tornadoes and ice storms and wind storms, not just for global pandemics. Um, we also have invested um, in, uh, oh, what I blank. There's, there's at least two other things I was going to share. Oh, some of our disease management teams. We hope this fall we'll have a new respiratory disease dashboard. So instead of just doing influenza, we can look at influenza, COVID, RSV, to try to give a more useful view of the impact of respiratory illnesses in the fall and winter and, and stuff that the public can actually see on a, on a website and actually use if they, if they choose to do that. So we are better and we are stronger, but I agree with you, Senator. What we need to see now is, is can we have a stronger public health system help to improve and strengthen the health of the public? And that is the mission of both the department and the cabinet, is to have healthier people and healthier communities so everybody can reach their full human potential. And we're committed to doing that, but we had a lot of rebuilding to do. And, and I think despite and because of COVID, the Kentucky public health system is better off today than it was a few years ago. I'm curious as to what happens with the next communicable disease outbreak, whatever it might be. Are we, we have to admit, we were kind of reactionary because nobody knew what we were dealing with. Um, is, is that an, kind of an indictment of this system? Because we're dealing with communicable diseases, does it have to be so COVID specific? Should we have processes in place that regards of what it is, if it's COVID-29, that we're better prepared next time than we were this time so do, have we have we had those learning experiences through this experience well covid was unprecedented in our any of our living history because all of humanity had no immune exposure to it it was a brand new disease that we had nothing prepared for it so we had no testing no treatments no vaccines n nothing so that that's what made that so seismically different if we were to have a hepatitis outbreak or um you know, we actually have, unfortunately, increasing syphilis. Uh, we have multi-drug resistant gonorrhea. We have, we have yeast infections that are alarmingly dangerous and difficult to treat um, and hit vulnerable folks uh, in institutionalized settings. Those, those are really, really serious problems that require antimicrobial stewardship. Um, the pharmaceutical industry to develop new and better drugs that respond to the situation. But I think for those, I think we have a better, a more strengthened network. If we had another brand new infection that all of humanity had never seen again, I hope we would do better. But I, I would just say what really was difficult then was not just the lack of knowledge. It was just we, we many of us look at the world and we just see it differently. And it was so, it becomes divisive, if not in the beginning, like in the first few months, but very quickly thereafter because the types of actions that had to be taken were so substantial because the risk was so substantial. So I think as a society, we, we just have to continue to um, continue to try to do the best we can to recognize what are those moments that really rise above the typical differences of you to like, this really, this really threatens us all. It places a real, you know, real danger to so many people that that's why things are done differently. I, I wish I could say we're going to do better if that were to happen again, uh, but I think hum, I, mean, hum, I study history. Humanity's <laughs> humanity has been humanity for a very very long time, and all I can say is I think in Kentucky, where we still have differences of opinion, I, I travel all over the state, and I I just I'll be guilty. I stopped at a McDonald's, and I feel badly as the health commissioner. <laughs> I don't feel like I should probably be eating at McDonald's. I saw it on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some nice uh, woman with her two middle school kids said, "I feel like I should say thank you," 
which I thought was very courteous. And I said, now I'm embarrassed because look at the example I'm setting as the health commissioner. But it's all I had time for before I came over here. So, but the point I would say is as I travel around the state, I, people say thank you all, all over the place. And people say thank you regardless of party and even identify party. And I don't think that means they agreed with everything. I don't mm -hmm. think that for one minute. I think they recognized, God, that really looked terrible. It was terrible, and, and thanks for at least trying. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if we continue to find where can we cooperate on things, I think we would do better, Senator. Um, but I also am sanguine about it. it. It'll continue to be a challenge because humanity is just humanity. And I guess that's what I'm looking for is a more um, proactive agenda rather than reactive. And I think we had that opportunity, but uh, that's uh, for further discussion. And, and, and if, I, if I might add, we're going to study this for 20 years. We're going to study our response for 20 years. We, we made right decisions. We made wrong decisions. We, what I hope is that we learn. And what I hope is that as we examine our responses, what was effective? What wasn't? What made a difference? What didn't? Those are all questions we, somebody's going to research it, but it's, it's, it's going to be decades, I think, before there's any sort of consensus about what were the most effective policies and what weren't. And, and, and we were doing the best we could with the knowledge we had, uh, but I think it, like a, this is going to be studied for a long time. And, and like I say, there, there'll be things that we find out that we did well, and there'll be things that we find out that we didn't. And we just have to, like this, here are the challenges we're facing, right? And, and as long as we can keep this kind of dialogue, I think we'll all learn together, and that's what we're supposed to do. I would agree. Any questions, comments from committee members? If not, uh, I thank all of you for your presentations today. Um, invaluable information, good start for us, and uh, I'm sure we'll be inviting you back to uh, future meetings as well. But thank you for your time and thank you for the job that you've done. You got one more. Would you like child care and DCBS? Oh yes, I'm sorry. I didn't that's mean okay. Looked at. Yeah, yes, that's very kind of, very important. I'm sorry. Some of yes. this is is probably of everything we presented. I think <laughs> these pieces are probably the most. Yes. Difficult. Excuse me for that oversight. Yep, should have had you first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Dennis, and I'm the acting commissioner for the Department for Community-Based Services. Please. Okay. Um, so for DCBS, we'll be talking about three different uh, program areas and the impact of the end of the public health emergency, child care, our child welfare programs, and public assistance. So we'll begin with child welfare. I'm, I'm sorry, child care. Child care. So with the end of the public health emergency, DCBS anticipates a decrease in the child care and development block grant funding as a lot of that uh, was one-time funding provided through CRISA and ARPA and that has to be liquidated by September of 2024. Areas um, or programs that we, um, that, will, that we will not be able to support with with the child care development, development block grant funding going forward, you see here on the screen um, the transitional funds, um, the, uh, the transitional child care assistance program, which is a program that we uh, began uh, to, um, because we know that child care is the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest benefit cliff that our families experience when they increase their, their wages and, and income. So we, we began that program um, and which, which allow families to continue to receive 50% uh, of their child care payments um, as, they, as they transitioned, as they transitioned from, um, in, from, from with increased income and, and work requirements, work. Um, so that transitional child care assistance program will not be able to continue um, after September of 2024 unless additional funding is uh, provided. And then our uh, child care sustainability payments um, will end. Uh, Kentucky was awarded $763 million in ARPA funds dedicated to child care and $470 million of those funds were designated for sustainability payments. Um, and those have been issued to child care providers over nine quarterly payments. Uh, we, we've issued seven of those and we have two remaining. Uh, those will end at the, with the end of the public health emergency. And then our startup grants for child care centers and homes. Um, we've been able to provide a lot of opportunities for uh, grants uh, that include uh, desert matching grants, preschool partnership 
grants, uh, business partnership grants, and, and family child care home grants to help increase uh, child care capacity across the state, usually utilizing this funding. And there'll be no um, funding stream uh, through the block grants to continue those. And I, I, of all the places that we've talked about, this is the cliff. This is the fiscal cliff. It's going to be tremendously challenging for the entire industry uh, as these uh, payments come to an end. Uh, I'm worried about it. You will hear from child care providers you'll, because they're worried about this too. Um, we're going to extend as far as we possibly can uh, with uh, existing funds, but at some point that's got to end. Um, the other piece, that last piece on here, is a piece that I happen to love. Um, we have really been able to start some small centers. We've been able to support some, a few big centers. Uh, and it, it really has, uh, what, about 40 of the family child, somewhere in that number. Yes. And those are all like the little family child, three, three and below in terms of uh, uh, caring for children. But it's sort of the start of a ladder of uh, entrepreneurship and support for uh, a child care and for folks getting back to work. And um, oh, I'd love to figure out how to, that's a small one. Um, but these are, these are important. You said it, these are, this is that benefits cliff. As we looked, and I guess it was two years ago, three years ago, the benefits cliff task force, um, this is it, it's child care. Um, and so, uh, uh, what we do here is probably going to have the greatest impact, I think, on uh, folks being able to go to work, um, the infrastructure for our counties. Um, I think those are the challenges that we're going to we're going to see. And I, I guess we can do them one at a time since this is the big one. Are they giving us a hint? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is. <laughs> But uh, first, I'll start off by saying I agree with you. Uh, even going into this, um, I assume this would be our biggest challenge going forward, and uh, it is going to take a lot of work and cooperation on all of our parts to try to address this because uh, um, for everything we talked about today, this is the most challenging. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mays Bledsoe, you have a question, comment? Uh, I do. Thank you. And I am. This is probably my biggest concern as well, just from what I hear, especially in some of the areas I represent. And having been to some of those child care centers, the concern about paying employees, which are already having a hard time staffing, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for the homes, the homes that are doing that. They're starting to have an impact. And even some of those larger centers that you've gotten grants to are now saying, we don't have enough um, kind of base, if you will, to sustain the drop off, because we don't have that history yet. We are new. And so that, they're at more risk, I think, than probably the more established centers who have kind of my kids went here, my other kids went here. And when you think about the lack of paid employees to actually run these programs, the domino is kind of everywhere. Um, you know, are you, are you putting together a, an ideal response, a here's how we're going to tamper off, here's how we're thinking about stopping the domino or delaying it? I know it's a large question. It is a large question. I think what's going to have, what's going to happen is we, in in partnership with you all, as we get through the next budget, we'll we'll have some pretty significant discussions. Um, I I know we will, um, and so we'll we'll do that through budget sub. Um, we'll we'll do that as we as we start to figure out what we do. Um, the general fund money is now in child care uh, in the state, which is great. Um, but uh, in order f to keep things sustained, we know we're going to have to look at what's what's the right, what can we do going forward. And I guess just the follow-up would be, I'd be very curious to see your best case, here's a medium, here's worst case scenario, and how you're looking at that domino from a funding and then from a um, holistic care, if you will, workforce place, daycare, all those kinds of things together in kind of a, in helping us understand some of those cliff options. And I'm sure you're working on that, but I'm in. Our, our extended uh, commitment youth, during the pandemic, there were uh, 
simplified processes for states to provide assistance to those youth, um, allowing flexibilities around some of the secondary education work program and uh, or employment requirements for those youth. And again, with the end of the uh, PAG, those flexibilities will um, be going away. And then also with regards to child welfare, um, we had flexibilities around um, virtual visits with our children out of home care. The federal, federal law requires um, that case workers, our social workers, visit with their children and out of home care face-to-face uh, -face monthly. And during the pandemic, there was increased flexibility around that requirement, allowing, um, allowing case workers to visit with children virtually when it was determined to be safe to do so. So we, we did exercise that flexibility during the pandemic, and there was a lot of benefit found to that on behalf of both uh, children as well as to our, our social workers, um, increased contact, um, our, our youth and out-of-home care are very adept, adept at using um, uh, uh, you know, uh, FaceTime and other, other, um, other uh, virtual methods of communication and find it sometimes more comfortable and we found they were more willing to open up and talk and share with us even in some of those platforms. So, um, but with the end of the public health emergency, that flexibility will uh, end as well, and uh, social workers will be required to uh, resume those face-to-face -face monthly visits. And again, we were doing we were doing a lot of those uh, anyhow, even with the flexibility in place. But um, you know, oftentimes children are placed outside of their home community, and sometimes that is that can be uh, far away. So um, the the flexibility really allowed. Uh, our caseworkers uh, increased um, decision making around their caseloads and how and how to best provide those services to our children out of home care. So, is there any questions with regards to the child welfare pieces before I move on to public assistance? Any questions? Yes. Um, the national fingerprint based. Uh, background check. So mm -hmm. am I understanding, was that on hold during the pandemic because people could not obviously come in and, and be fingerprinted? So, Correct. so that will be, that will, that is ending and people will now starting July will have to be required. We'll have to be in compliance with the requirements of the national fingerprint uh, background check. Uh, we also passed legislation, I believe in 2020, uh, to support, um, to, to align with the federal requirements uh, uh, requiring all of our, our um, child care providers as well as our own staff within DCBS to be fingerprinted. Um, and so we've been working with to expand our, um, our platform on CARES, the, uh, um, don't ask me what CARES stands for right now, but that, that, uh, that system that we utilize with KSP and the FBI to, to bring us up to standards. Um, the national standards to be in compliance with that uh, with that law. So uh, again, we uh, we have until June June thirtieth to be in compliance. Okay, and we've well, been working on this throughout the pandemic with implementation and development of that of those the, that program, CARES program. What is the average time that it takes someone to go through that process? And, and particularly, what I'm curious about is how that holds up other components of whether that be workforce development, right, getting new workers on, but also our foster parents, right? So as a former foster parent with the state um, and somebody who still does mentorship through the University of Kentucky, I just uh, talked to a family the other day that it's, took them 14 months to get through the process. And I know the extreme need that we have for, for good quality homes um, and to say we are on a shortage is an understatement, but I'm just wondering what we can do to help expedite that process for our families. So we have been actually working during, during um, all along to build our capacity within their within the care system to make that process easier and more quicker. Um, if it's an in-state background check, uh, those are done, um, I say relatively quickly, but within two to five days, usually within a week's time frame. Um, but if it's, um, but it, if it's, and, and that's like I said, that's our average turnaround time. Um, but um, if it's an out-of-state request, then that's where we have to uh, involve uh, KSP and some of the FB, the, you know, those, those pieces, uh, and those can take longer 
So if, if an individual has lived out of state within the last five years, then we have to complete the out of state background check and that, that can be a, a longer, uh, take longer to get back. So we're dependent upon other agencies. Will individuals continue to have to come to their headquarters? So for in Jefferson County, that's the LNN building, right? That's where I did my fingerprinting many moons ago. Um, or do we have any sort of flexibility to be able to have people dispatch to individual, you know, you're doing your, your, um, uh, I've blanked on the word, but basically uh, your your home inspection or your home check, right, where your social worker is coming in. Do we have the ability for those individuals to do that or for a specialized person to go to those individual homes to do that to help move that process along? Do we have any ability to be creative or flexible? Not yet. The okay. care system is uh, within the inspector general's office. It, it is an improvement over some of the manual checks. Uh, it also is what's called a wrap back feature. So if additional, if something happens later on, um, it will inform that, that there's additional, something happened. Um, so it, that will be an improvement, but we haven't in that system got to the point where we could, where that's a mobile system. Um, I, it just isn't yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please continue. And lastly, impacts to our public assistance program. So um, with the end of the public health emergency, we'll be reinstating the supplemental nutrition assistance program, the SNAP time, time limits. So uh, adults ages 18 to 49 who are subject to the general work requirements and who do not have dependents, who we refer to as ABODs, able-bodied adults without dependents, can't receive SNAP benefits for more than three months uh, within a three-year period unless they are participating in an ENT or uh, other educational or work, um, um, either paid or volunteer for, for work requirement for at least 20 hours per week on average. So those time limits and requirements uh, will be back in place. Uh, we uh, also um, have in increased Kentucky work uh, program outreach and engagement to increase work participation ahead of the unwinding. Um, work requ requirements for KTAP recipients who are work eligible went back into place last July and recipients had until November to meet requirements or would experience penalties or disqualifications uh, beginning in December. And then lastly, I uh, just want to mention again, the lack of childcare options has, um, has been, we've talked about that repeatedly as a barrier and one of our biggest uh, benefit, cliff, uh, um, benefit cliffs and that continues to be a barrier to work participation. And just like public health and the grant funding, the debt ceiling limit, uh, place some additional work requirements around SNAP that we're still figuring out as well as TANF. So those two pieces um, we will, of course, be implementing as the debt ceiling and the, and the rules come out about that. Any questions, comments? Getting a little premature earlier, but again, thank you for your presentation today and the valuable information you provided us. Um, I think it's already helped us put some things into focus as to what can have to be a priority for us this next legislative session, but this is a work in progress. And so we move on to next steps. And just a reminder that our next meeting is July 24, 2023. I would encourage our committee members to look at the charge of this committee, I think, which you provided, because uh, it can be kind of wide, kind of unwieldy, but specifically, not to preach to you, but. Um, our task force will examine the structure, operations, program, policy, and procedure within the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, determine if or how service can be delivered more effectively and efficiently, examine Kentucky's benefit cliffs, and continue the work of the prior benefits cliff task force. So a, a wide uh, charge that we have before us to that end. Uh, between now and the next time we meet, if you have any particular areas that you would like us to take a look at or concentrate on, Please let myself know or uh, co-chair Mead, and we'll try to incorporate that into a future meeting. But with that, um, we'll be working on the agenda and get it out to you just as soon as possible. Uh, with that, any other questions, comments for uh, the good of the cause? If not, then we'll stand adjourned. Thanks, everyone, for your participation today. Thank you.